and you might miss a couple things on um, on Friday, depending on when your flight is, and then you come back Sunday and you go right back to classes. But uh, it makes it fun. So just a few things that we will see. I don't know how familiar you all are with Florence, uh, but the Duomo is the main cathedral there. It's sort of the iconic building in Florence that you'll see in any view or, or picture uh, with its famous dome by Brunelleschi, Filippo Brunelleschi, who's one of the kind of masters and founders of the Renaissance. Uh, and the cathedral is built by Arnolfo di Cambio in, a, in the 14th century, who's one of the primary architects for the way Florence takes shape in the very early Renaissance. And that's really, um, we don't necessarily start off there, but that's really kind of um, indicative of what the whole course is about, uh, which is, you know, we're studying the Renaissance and, re and especially Renaissance art in Florence in the sort of cradle of this style in this period. Of course, the Renaissance is happening elsewhere. You have the Northern Renaissance with painters like Van Eyck and printmakers like Albert Dürer. But it's in Florence where the ideas that are um, initiating and building the Renaissance uh, with their look back to the classical period and um, collectors studying ancient texts and ancient artworks then have their artists that they're currently supporting try to reproduce that environment. So there's really an effort to make a new classical era uh, in, I mean, in a number of places, but it really gets started in Florence in a lot of ways. Um, so the cathedral has always been kind of a, a primary monument of what the Renaissance is really about, especially with Brunelleschi's um, uh, technical facility and, and, and innovative solutions to be able to build this giant uh, dome over this expansive space. Um, so I'm showing you this here. You can actually go up inside the dome because one of his unique solutions is that he actually builds two domes, one inside the other. And this allows for this cavity to climb up in between the domes and come up here and have this kind of beautiful view of Florence and the surroundings. And it's, sort, it's, it's one of the kind of bucket list things to do in Florence. I will say we will go to the cathedral for the class. We will not go up in the dome as part of the class experience, but your ticket for the cathedral includes, at least it used to, um, I have to admit, I haven't looked, uh, I didn't look at that before this, but um, it, it, it should include the trip up into the, up into the dome there. So it's worth doing at least once. It's a whole lot of steps, it's a long way up to go, but it's cool. It's like walking up a fun house because of the way the stairs are through there. Uh, the Piazza della Signoria and the Palazzo Vecchio, that's the sort of government heart of the building, uh, of the city. The Palazzo Vecchio used to be called the Palazzo della Signoria and it was uh, also built by Arnolfo di Cambio. And that's where the government of the city um, used to meet. Florence in the 14th and 15th centuries was a republic. And so it had a representative government, it had a senate and the senate would meet here. Um, in the 16th century, Florence became a duchy under the Medici. And so the first Duke lived in there for a while and made a lot of changes uh, to its interior. Um, and then the ex outside of the space has always been a um, kind of primary civic space for meetings, for events, and for the display of art. And so it's a, you know, this is one of the unique spaces that's kind of uh, essential for a trip like this because, you know, you know, we can look at this stuff on online all the time, but you'll never really get, you know, or on the computer, you'll never really get the, the cohesive experience, the holistic experience, uh, the, the, the spatial experience, plus with everything else, the sounds, the sights, um, all the senses that you get being in there and you can see you know some different depictions one earlier in the day in the day when it's not quite as full uh this side is really what it normally looks like just kind of especially in the middle of the day kind of packed and thronged uh, but you can see all the sculptures 
that are there. There's a few of them, including The David by Michelangelo. That's, of course, just a reproduction. The original one is in the academia that, we'll, that we will go and see. But here you can see where it was originally placed and how it works in conjunction with the site and with the other sculptures. This loggia here, that's the loggia de Lanzi, which has more sculptures in it. And so it's this um, kind of a, exciting urban experience. Uh, that's great. And the other interesting thing, of course, is that it's just down the street from the Duomo, from the cathedral. So you have the religious center of the city just a few blocks away down this straight shot from the government uh, part, part of the city. And the way those two things, uh, those two sites intersect is really interesting. And um, again, one of the unique things about a trip like this, because that you, you get to experience how they work in conjunction and how they're laid out and how the city is laid out and the, um, the experience that you have as you move through that city. So we go into the Palazzo Vecchio. In fact, I wrote my dissertation, my PhD dissertation on paintings in this palace. Uh, one of my book, which is called City Views in the Habsburg and Medici Regime or something like that, um, which came out a couple years ago, has a couple chapters about paintings in this um, palace. Uh, so we'll go in there and um, uh, as you can see, here's me on a previous uh, one of these tours um, talking about this. So. I'm realizing now that I was running late and in such a rush, I'm sorry I was late, I had to pick my daughter up, that I forgot to introduce myself. Um, but uh, Kelly Heath, I think, you know, said at least uh, introduced me a little bit. I am a, I'm a professor of Italian Renaissance art history. I think I know most of you. Um, and my main work is on artworks in Florence in the Renaissance, especially in the mid 16th century. So as I said, I've did a lot of work in the Palazzo Vecchio. I've also done a lot of work on sculpture, especially a sculptor named Francesco da Sangallo who worked in Florence throughout the 16th century. So I really know the art um, well. I mean, that's my main point of expertise, the culture. And I've spent a lot of time in Florence itself. I've lived there for six months at one point. Uh, I've been back numerous times. This would be my, I forget what I told you, Kelly, seventh or eighth, leading my seventh or eighth trip to Florence. Plus I go back there for research um, regularly as well. Um, so I, I know it, I know it fairly well. It's kind of like a second home um, to me. So uh, we'll go through there. We'll also go to the Uffizi, one of the kind of main European main Western art museums in the world. Uh, they've got a tremendous, it's primarily a painting gallery. They do have ancient sculpture as well. The nucleus of it is formed by the Medici collections that they started back in the 15th century and continued to accumulate through a few centuries. Uh, it used to be the offices of the duchy. That's why it's called the Uffizi, it means offices. Um, but today it's just a painting gallery uh, and an art museum. Um, and so this is where we will see Botticelli, uh, the, pre the Birth of Venus, the Primavera, a number of other works. They have Caravaggio's, they have uh, oh, almost any, any primary Florentine Renaissance artwork that you, could, that you could think of. They have Titian's, who's from Venice, of course, so it's not only Florentine. They have some Northern stuff also. Uh, and that's just in the one museum. There are a number of other museums in Florence and churches in Florence that we will go to. So I mentioned the Academia. That's where we'll see Michelangelo's David. Uh, the Bargello is the sculpture museum. That's where we'll see works like Donatello's David. And this is what we're going to spend the week doing, is going to all of these sites and being on site and talking about these works. So, you know, obviously in a space like this, uh, you get a sense for what floor almost what Florence was like still in the Renaissance because some of these places really haven't changed very much and that's one of the reasons why I love the Palazzo Vecchio so much it's still used it's both a museum but it's also the um, offices of the mayor of Florence but it's one of the few sites 
um, almost a few sites in Europe, but especially one of the couple sites in Florence that almost remains unchanged in a lot of ways. Obviously, they've moved furniture around and things, but the decoration of it is is still very much like it was decorated in the 16th century. Uh, as opposed to going to the Uffizi, where you see works like Botticelli and Titian, or the Academia, like Michelangelo, or the Bargello, like seeing the Donatello, these have been taken out of their original context. The beauty of this, of course, is we still get to go to these places, see these works in person, which is an entirely different experience. I'll, I remember when I did my first trip to Florence, my first trip to Europe, I was about your guys' age. I, was, I did exactly this, a short study abroad trip. Uh, mine was over the summer, it was three weeks, and we went to Florence, Rome, and um, city in, oh, uh, Munich in Germany, Munich in Germany. And um, I remember, you know, as a art history student, I thought, oh my gosh, I've seen the Mike, I've seen the David like 500 times by now. It's not a big deal. What's the big deal? I don't, you know, uh, but then we walked in and immediately I was like, whoa, okay, this is why we do this trip. Because it's just, it's a totally different experience. That thing, that this guy here is 13 feet tall, for one thing. A scale you just get no uh, kind of understanding of from pictures and how that and how that works. Whereas the Donatello is more so slightly smaller than life size, and so it, you know just experiencing both of those things and understanding how they work, the intimacy of the Donatello David versus the the kind of grandeur of the Michelangelo David can really only be experienced when you're when you're standing in front of it. Uh, we'll visit the Medici palaces. Uh, much of the history of Florence and the Renaissance is wrapped up with the Medici as the main collectors and patrons of art, the rulers of Florence. Even when it was a republic, they were kind of, they were technically, not technically, they were uh, really in charge of Florence. Everybody did what they wanted because they had so much money. So we'll, we won't tour the Palazzo Medici here on Via Largo. We will see it and we'll talk about it from outside. You certainly can go in and tour it on your own, but there is so much to do in Florence. It's impossible to do everything in a week. You know, even by my probably 16th time in Florence, I was still going to new spaces because there's just so much to see there. We will tour the Palazzo Pitti, which is gigantic. Uh, it also is a painting gallery. You see some of the paintings there. They have Raphael's, they have a lot of Andrea del Sarto's, Botticelli, all sorts of things. Um, they also have some of the rooms set up like the Dukes live, uh, uh, lived in it in the 18th century. And that leads into the Boboli Gardens. Now that's a fun day because, you know, we go through the, um, we go through the palace and the painting uh, 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 galleries. And then we get to go out and spend the rest of the day in the Boboli Gardens. And um, I kind of just let you go because the gardens are really much more uh, ex better to be experienced on your own because there's formal layouts like you can see here with fountains. There's small kind of labyrinthine paths. There's places where you can play, you know, toss the ball around or sit down and have a picnic. So I try to orchestrate that so we go into the gardens around lunchtime and you can go out and get a sandwich and bring it in and kind of chill in the, in the thing. And they have fun things like this um, grotto which you can't normally go in there. Every once in a while they have it open specially. So I think the last time I was there, I got to go into it. Uh, but normally you see it from outside. But these are Michelangelo. These are, uh, originally they were the actual Michelangelo sculptures. Today, those are in the academia too, but they put recreations in here. So you can see how those Michelangelo sculptures were fit into this kind of fake cave, basically. And of course there's, you know, the rest of famous Florentine culture, like the Ponte Vecchio, a bridge from probably the 13th uh, if, century, if not older, that has always had gold, uh, gold sellers on it, and it still does. There's still jewelry shops on there. So if you want to buy some gold, you could, some gold jewelry, you could go there. It's very expensive, but um, I, I mean, I don't shop there, but maybe you can. Um, but it is, you know, kind of just a major meeting point. Usually I try not to walk us across it because it's just so crowded, but we'll probably go across it once or twice. Uh, but it's nice to go across in the evenings because there's usually like somebody out playing under the little loggia here as the sun is setting and, you know, playing music and all. So, uh, so that's really nice. 
Um, so here, and as I said, you know, we're going to go to all these places. We're going to talk about it. This is what this class is about. It's it's almost taught it taught almost entirely on site. We'll have a few meetings before we go. Um, but uh, for the most part, you know, the bulk of the class will be walking around Florence, being in these churches, being in these museums, and talking about how how this all works. And even being on the street, you can see we're out on the street. So some classes are just held out in the open, uh, out in the open there. Uh, and so here's David, and we'll talk a little bit about the David, for instance, standing in, fr in, it, in front of it in the academia. Um, and here, you know, again, it is out on the Palazzo della Signoria. You can see me with my little Britney Spears mic there. Or something I'm, that's probably too old of a reference for you guys. Uh, but you know, we do have um, these like a uh, mic PA systems, right? So my first year, we went there. We did not have those, and I shouted myself hoarse like almost every day. So then we invested in those things, and it makes it a lot easier to hear and kind of understand what's going on. Uh, the major assignment for this course is the development of a research paper, um, which you will start prior to going to Florence. You'll pick a work of art that uh, we will see, and I'll, I'll provide a list um, of, of some guidelines. Uh, you'll pick a work of art that we will see, and you will develop a presentation. Once we get to Florence, when we go to that location, you will give your presentation. So here's two of them. He's uh, talking about the um, Trinity by Masaccio here. She's presenting on these two um, panels, um, the competition panels for the baptistry by Brunelleschi and Ghiberti. Uh, she's presenting on Donatello's Penitent Magdalene, and here we are presenting about the facade of San Lorenzo, which you can see looks really ugly, but that's because they never actually ended up developing the facade of San Lorenzo. There were a number of projects that went into that, but uh, never got finished. And here's presenting on this um, Tree of Life fresco by Tadeo Gatti, that's in Santa Croce. Uh, you know, I'll note, by the way, just as we're looking at all these, you know, one thing you can see everybody's standing all the time. And, I, and I'll just note that uh, it, it is relatively physical because we're moving around so much and kind of constantly going. Um, the way it's set up generally is to have a session in the morning and then take a break in a session in the afternoon. And not always, I'll show you that in just a second. Um, each session is usually about two to two and a half hours uh which usually isn't too big of a deal but a couple hours in a museum on hard marble floors gets to be long so i just you know i, I always want people to know to, to be prepared and especially to bring comfortable shoes you will hear me tell you that like 500 times as we prepare for this the first year we the first year i took somebody uh and i think that was before i even i was at webster or might have been my first trip. Actually, no, I think it was my first year I took students from Webster. Uh, somebody brought sandals and it was like 40 degrees outside. And not only could she like not walk around all day, but she ended up getting bronchitis and had to miss a couple of days. So wear comfortable shoes. We're on our feet a lot. We're walking around the city uh, most of the time. The beautiful thing of Florence is it's not very big. So we will spend most of our time walking around. Is it, you know, there is a little bit of ground transportation that your fee includes, and that's primarily just to get to and from the airport. Um, while we're on, on site, you know, everything's within walking distance, just within even 10 minutes or so of each other. <clears throat> um, there is one free day. So you can, you know, you can spend your day in Florence exploring more of Florence if you want to. Uh, you can certainly do a day trip. Uh, here's just a couple day trips. Pisa is a very easy day trip. That's uh, maybe an hour by train. Um, you can go see the Leaning Tower there. Um, and there's a, there's a number of other things to see in Pisa. That's not the only thing to see there. Uh, or you can make the trek up to Venice. I've done that in a day. Uh, as well. It makes for a very long day. It's about a two and a half or three hour train trip. But if you leave early enough and come back late enough, it's um, it's certainly doable. And I've done that. Same with Rome. That makes for a crazy long day, but 
it's I've done that too. Um, Siena though is probably the easiest day trip to do and is a really wonderful one because it's small, it's very close. It's only about 30 minutes away from Florence and buses go there all the time. And it's still very much a um, medieval town. The, the Medici captured Siena in 1555 and immediately put a halt to architectural construction as a way of controlling the urban, uh, the, the politics and the urban site. Uh, and so it's still, I mean, it's had some development since then, but for the most part, the majority of the city is still very much like it was in 1555. Uh, it's a nice place to be. You can hey, go hang out on the uh, campo down here. If it's a nice day out, they use it like a beach. You'll see people sunbathing out there and have, you know, glass of wine or uh, sparkling water or whatever out there. You can go up in this giant tower and see everything and these people are actually, they tried to expand the cathedral in the, fifth, in the late 14th century. And then the plague hit before they finished. So they built this wall to make, the, to make it bigger. But after the plague, they ran out of money and their politics like disintegrated. So they never finished it. So these days you can go, they're standing on this, um, on this leftover wall there. Um, certainly plenty of shopping to do. In Florence, a lot of it's one thing that people always want to do there. They have this uh, leather market. So it's leather is one of the things they're known for. Wool, um, uh, and as I said, gold. Those are the kind of three main things that Florence is generally known for. Silk, some you'll see a lot of silk scarves. Leather is probably the biggest thing that people kind of are on the lookout for. So there's a couple of those markets. And of course, you get to eat the wonderful. Italian food, just looking at this makes me excited to go back and have Italian pizza. Uh, and gelato, we go here, this is Vivoli, which is like the premier gelateria in Florence, famous since the 19th century that all the guidebooks will tell you to go to. So we go there on the first day um, and they're all getting, it's not my favorite gelateria. It's very good gelato, it just tends to be busy. So I, I prefer some other places. Uh, there's some traditional Florentine dishes, risotto, um, ribolita, which is just one of my favorites. Uh, so good. It's like porridge, but it's very good. And um, my favorite dessert, tiramisu. My kids will tell you, in fact, any student who's gone on this trip with you, with me, will tell you that I love tiramisu. I'll get it at every restaurant for every dessert that I go to. And I've certainly tried many more adventurous things. So if you're into that, you can you can find it. This is pigeon. One time I tried, they had pigeon on a menu. So I tried that. That's the pigeon head that they served with the pigeon. I will not eat that again, but you can. That's a little anchovy. Uh, and you just get to have a good time. Um, we do two um, group dinners, one when we arrive and one the night before we leave as just sort of a welcome to Florence and, uh, you know, we bonded. Thanks for a great trip, Neil. So these are these are two of them. Um, and it's a, it's a fun time. The, it's a lot of food and uh, good times. You can see these are my two daughters. Uh, they often come with me. So you'll see them around too. This is my this is my wife here. So they come with me. They, my wife has um, uh, been to Florence nearly as much as I have and often just kind of helps out. It's been very useful to have her around too. Like, you know, if, some, if somebody, every once in a while I have to take somebody to the doctor or something. And so she can lead the group to the next, um, the next site, you know, and she, she speaks enough Italian to help out and get around too. And my kids are starting to learn Florence too. So they, they do the same. And these are just pictures of the site at group at different sites. That's the back of Palazzo Pitti. Here we are up, here we are up on uh, Piazzale Michelangelo, where you get a great look out over the city. I think this was my first, the first trip I took way back when. So again, there's the dates. Um, we don't have, we still don't have a solid program fee yet, right, Kelly? 
you're muted. Yep, sorry. Yeah, not yet. Okay. I don't believe it's coming yet. Uh, so this is what it was based on last last time, um, and we're waiting to get confirmation on that. Uh, but as you can see, that fee includes lodging. So we'll stay in a hotel. Well, you'll you'll room with a couple uh, probably a couple students to at least one. Um, two group meals, as I said, all the entrance fees to all the hotels and uh, hotels, museums and churches and things. Uh, some local transportation and the insurance that's health insurance that study abroad provides you, which is included in the study abroad fee that you um, do use as your down payment. You're responsible for your airfare. The reason we do that, I used to include the airfare, but the reason we do that is in case a um, couple things, in case you have like mileage you want to use uh, or you could get something cheaper or you may want to leave earlier or stay later and see more of Florence or go to Rome for a few days and then come to Florence or vice versa, something like that. So you have some options. You do not have to travel with a group on Friday and leaving on Sunday if you want to you know, do something else. Your basic requirement is that you have to be in Florence on Saturday, like midday, and you have to stay through Sunday. And of course, you're spending money, your other meals and things like that. Uh, this is um, our basic itinerary. Now, I will say I did not update this from the date. So originally, you know, the last, of course, we planned to do this trip was just was just this past March over this this last most recent spring break. So we've pushed it back. And I'm sorry, I just didn't have time to update these dates. But the days are the same. So this is our basic itinerary. Saturday, we arrive in Florence. We get settled at the hotel. We do a walking tour. We get the gelato. We end up at the Piazzale Michelangelo. We have a group dinner. The reason I do that is um, primarily, uh, you know, it, it tends to be kind of a hard day, but fortunately, you'll be so excited to be there that it'll kind of keep your energy up to a degree. Um, but you know, I try to give people a little bit of time to relax, but then I like to get you out and see the city, orient you, and also keep you going so that you can go to sleep and kind of get your, you know, your rhythms back on a regular clock. I think that's generally the best way in my experience. Uh, the next day, we start off right at the Uffizi because that gives kind of a nice overview of, of the Renaissance and art. And then we go kind of back to the beginnings to Santa Croce uh, in the afternoon. Um, the next day, you can see there's a lot of stuff we do. And for the most part, this is grouped. I try to group it thematically, but I also try to take be aware of where we are in the city. So sometimes things are grouped based on where we are, like San Lorenzo Medici chapels and San Lorenzo and the Palazzo Medici. Those are all like right there, right by each other. So we do that in the morning, the afternoon, we go to the Duomo and the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. The next day is, um, we don't have a break that day. Uh, we go through, it's a little bit longer of a morning, but that gives you a longer afternoon. So we go to Santa Trinita, we see the Palazzo Rucellai, and then Santa Maria Novella. Uh, and then on Thursday, and then you have your free day. Uh, Thursday, we have we, uh, the Ospedale degli Innocenti, the Santissima Annunziata, is a church there, and San Marco. San Marco is my other favorite place in Florence. It's decorated by Fra Angelico. It was a monastery, but it too, like the Palazzo Vecchio, is still decorated like it was in the 15th century. And so it's one of the great places to see that, as well as the Academia. So that's all in the same arrangement also. That's a little bit of a longer morning, I think. Um, uh, depending on how things shake up, we may take a break, you know, and just kind of get a little refreshment before we move on. Uh, the next day is Friday is about sculpture. So we go to Orsan Michele and then we walk over to the Bargello. That's in the morning. And then the afternoon is about the Medici Dukes. We go to the Palazzo, Piazza della Signoria and the Palazzo Vecchio. And then the last day is the day we go to the Palazzo PT in the Boboli Gardens. And I said, you know, that's a little bit more of a relaxed day. You get to play in the gardens and chill out and we have our evening dinner and then we leave. I can't remember why I put that in there, but uh, that's French by Francesco da Sangallo. We will see that sculpture, but that's one of the sculptures I'm working on. But anyway, uh, so who has questions? 
Well, I'll tell you more then that people always want to know. So I haven't been to Florence in October in a very long time, uh, but I'm hoping that it's actually going to be quite nice. Uh, it's right after the end of the primary tourist season, which usually goes through September. Um, so I'm hoping that a lot of the crowds will drop off in October, but yet will still remain relatively warm and comfortable. The benefit of going in March is that no, almost no tourists, I mean, there's still plenty of tourists around, but, all, but very few in comparison. Uh, the downside of it, though, is that everything is still really cold because Florence is entirely stone. And so these buildings serve as like refrigerators. They just hold this chill air. So it could be like 70 degrees outside and you're running around in a t-shirt getting hot from the sun and you go in a church and it's like 50 degrees in there and you're freezing. Uh, so that's why you saw me. I mean, you know, it's not always 70 either. A lot of times it's 50. So that's why you saw me in a lot of times in jacket and hat and everything like that. So you got to dress in layers. And I think you want to probably bring some light layers for October, but I don't think it will be quite as chill as it would be in March. I think it should still have some of the residual warmth from September. Um, so I think that'll be a little more, more comfortable while still dying, dialing down the amount of tourists. Um, everybody always knows wants to know like, you know, how much money to bring. And if you sign up, we can, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that and like how to pack and how to plan and all that, you know, as we go forward. Um, of course, you know, all that depends on how much you want to spend and how you eat, but uh, you know, it's very possible to eat on a very limited budget in Florence, if you know where to go. And I could point you in those directions. Of course, that means that you're eating like, sandwiches that are just bread and a couple pieces of meat or a piece of pizza or something like that. But if you want to do that, you could get by on 10, you know, 10 to 15 euro a day or so. Um, but a good meal is usually around, when I say a good meal, so when they, so when Italians eat a, a meal, they do it in stages. So they will eat their appetizer and then they'll eat their first course, the primi, and then they eat their second course, the secondi. If you want any vegetables, you order those on the side, and then you eat your dessert. So if you eat that way, you have this kind of full Italian meal, that's when things start to get kind of pricey. Um, although plenty of, plenty of places in Florence will offer a fixed price meal for tourists. It's not usually the best food, but it'll probably taste very good to you because compared to what we tend to have here in America, it's still pretty good quality. You can find those for like 15 to 20 euro. Um, but if you want something like pizza, pizza is probably around 10 to 15 euro. And you'd order, usually people order a whole pizza for, you know, it's like a personal pizza, essentially. So that kind of gives you a sense. Um, Soda is really expensive. It's like three euro or so. So if you drink soda, I'm sorry. Coffee's really cheap. So woohoo, I like coffee. That's like a euro. If you drink espresso. Uh, these days, it's very easy to get American coffee. So um, I don't drink that over there. So I don't know what that costs, but uh, you can. You can. Gelato is like a euro to a euro and a half. Um, so um, what else do people want to know? You guys must have questions. Yeah, Darby. 